You know Christmas is almost here when there are more pine needles on the carpet than on the tree. You know Christmas is almost here when the credit card is smoked along with the turkey and the ham. <laughs> you know Christmas is almost here when you've seen It's a Wonderful Life 13 times. You know it's almost Christmas when a trip to the mall and back is more challenging than the Indianapolis 500. You know Christmas is almost here when you hear those Salvation Army people ringing their bell. You know Christmas is almost here when your Christmas list is written in black and your checkbook is almost written in red. <laughs> you know Christmas is almost here when that infamous fruitcake returns after 12 months of hiding. <laughs> Christmas is almost here. And we're talking today about something that's Really not a whole lot about Christmas, but we're talking about giving. Learning to be a content giver. Kind of, I didn't know we were going to be having the answer to congregational meeting today when I planned this sermon, but God did, I guess. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. <coughs> Philippians 4, and Bernie must have known that it was close to Christmas too, because she filled in the blanks for you in the morning too. I don't have to do that either. She gave you a gift. Philippians 4, starting verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble beings, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Ephroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. After a sermon on giving, an ambitious young man approached the preacher and promised him that he would begin tithing. The minister told him that the Lord would bless him if he did so. Well, he was making approximately $400 a week, and so his tithe came out to $40. And that was great, but he, he really put out himself, and uh, his ambition and enthusiasm over the years caused him to make $5,000 a week. And that meant to keep tithing, he had to give $500 a week. So he called his minister and asked if he thought he could be released from his promise to tithe. The minister said, I don't see how you can be released from your promise. But you could start praying that God would reduce your income back to $400 so you only have to give $40 a week. Well, he continued to give his $500 to keep his promise that he had made. Someone has said, it's not what you do with a million dollars if fortune should come your lot, 
but what you are doing with the dollar and fifty that you've already got. So the amount is not the issue, it's what you do with what you have. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Learn to be content with what you have. That doesn't mean you can't dream of more or even dream of less, but it means that you have found that contentment with what you have. In this message, we want to look at giving. We want to see how we can become content in giving what we do. First of all, contentment comes in caring for others. I think of, of all the things that sets us apart as Christians than anything else, it's the fact that we, we care for other people. You know, we want to help other people. We want to do things that helps other people. Whether that's missions, or whether it's helping your neighbor. If we're a Christian, then part of who we are is caring about other people. The Philippians had this concern for Paul. In verse 10, Paul says that they had concern, but they had just lacked the opportunity. The Philippians, he says, he, they gave more than once to Paul. They had given several times of it in life. In fact, he says that after he left Macedonia, only the Philippians said supported him. No one else. Why do you think they did that? Well, it's because they must have cared a great deal for Paul. They supported him both financially and spiritually. And I think that's important too. There are ways that we can show concern and care for people that doesn't have anything to do with money. You know? And so we don't just always have to respond by giving money to show that we care. The Philippians were a blessing to Paul because they had helped him out in his affliction. Now, we aren't told what that affliction was. Maybe it was the fact that he'd been in jail. I don't know. But he, he was helped out. They helped and met his needs, verse 14 says. They felt good about that. And they felt contentment that they had been used by God to bless Paul. And they were also then in turn blessed by God because they showed concern for someone else. Back in 1988, during the presidential election, there was an unexpected shift in attention because the evening news, which was focused on the candidates, turned its attention to something else. It seems that up in uh, the frozen north, in the migratory route of the whales, there were some whales that had gotten stuck in the ice. At first, there was a few Eskimos who had chainsaws that were trying to cut through ice to get them back to their migratory route. But once the news got a hold of this story, all kinds of people turned up. Volunteers flocked everywhere, from everywhere, and brought their heavy machinery and equipment and things, trying to help these poor whales that had gotten stuck in the ice. Volunteers' ingenuity and energy soon became exhausted and the National Guard had to be called in to help out. They brought in helicopters, they dropped a five-ton concrete basher that broke the ice to help the whales get to where they weren't supposed to be going. The United States and, and the Soviet Union cooperated to help the whales. The Soviet Union dispatched two ice-breaking ships that helped in the rescue. After three weeks of breaking ice, finally the whales were free. After expending $1.5 million to free these whales, they were free. The 
heroic and noble rescue sparked a sense of compassion throughout the world. That saved these quails. But sadly, where is the compassion for all the lost people in the world? Where is the news media telling us the real reason for Christmas? Instead of reporting on how badly the retail stores are doing compared to last year. How many people could have been saved if people would just show as much concern and compassion for people who are lost as they did for these whales who are stuck in the ice? This story is told by Chuck Swindoll in his book, The Grace Awakening. When we care for other people and give to meet their needs, something happens. We find contentment because we know we've done something good. We know we've done something right. We know some, we've done something that God blesses and proves of. So you need to ask yourself the question, and I need to ask myself the question, what have we done to help someone else? What have we done to help someone that's lost? Where's our compassion? Where's our care? Well, if we care and we show compassion, we will find contentment. Second thing we see here is that contentment comes when we learn from our circumstances. I found it interesting that in verse 11 and verse 12, we, in the English, we have the word learn two times. In verse 11 it's found, and then in verse 12 it's found. But in the Greek, it's two different words. Both translated learn. When that happens, that gets me to think a little bit. There, there must be a difference, or they would have used the same Greek word. And there, there is a difference. In verse 11, Paul says, I have learned to be content. Here in this 11th verse, what he, the word that he uses means to learn, to understand, <coughs> to find something out, to discover, to know. But then in the very next verse, verse 12, Paul says, I have learned the secret of being content. And even though it's the same word in English, it's different in, in Greek. And in in the Greek, the word means, I have learned to know the secret, to be initiated into the mystery, to be instructed or taught. There's a little bit of difference there. What he's basically saying to us is that whatever our circumstances, we can learn from that. We can, we can learn and we can know that we are pretty special that God would reveal something so great as contentment to us. And the good thing here is that contentment is something that can be learned. It's not just something that we fall into. Some people are getting lucky and fall into it. Other people never do. No, it's something that we can actually learn. We can learn contentment. Paul had circumstances, circumstances that were both good and, and difficult. He knew being in poverty, he also knew being in prosperity. He, he'd been in all sorts of situations, yet he had learned to be content in whatever circumstances he found himself. And maybe that's true of you too. You know, maybe you've been, been down, you've been up, you know, you've been well off, you've been poor. We, we can learn from our circumstances. Paul had been in want, he had humble means, he'd been in prosperity, in hunger, satisfied, he'd been in abundance, he'd suffered need, he'd been in affliction. Throughout all those times, he says, he'd been content. Whatever situation he found himself in. Contentment means this. It means that you are self-sufficient or satisfied with the way things are. You get along with the way things are. 
no matter what Paul's circumstances were, he had learned that the secret of getting along with them was contentment. And he had learned that the way he knew all, whatever those circumstances were, was Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the secret of Paul's being content. So in whatever circumstances he was in, he learned from those Jesus Christ helped him to be content with them. Paul's sufficiency came not from things, but from a, from a person, from Jesus Christ. His sufficiency was from the relationship he had with Christ. And he tells us that in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, that, that means so much more when you put it in the context of these other verses, doesn't it? We can memorize that verse. It's pretty cool. And it's pretty easy to memorize because it's so short. But it also should remind us of all the circumstances that Paul was in. And the reason he could be content in all those circumstances was because he knew his strength came from Christ. So no matter what your circumstances may be today, you can be content too. Because of Jesus Christ. The third thing about contentment is contentment comes when you give generously. Paul says something that's, that's really deep here. And it, it, I think it needs to be explained. And you, you need to get it. Okay? He wanted the Philippians to give not because he wanted their gifts. He was wanting them to give not because he wanted their money. Although it certainly helped him, he says, in his times of need and affliction. He wanted them to give to see the profit that came into their accounts. Because when you give, you have an account out here somewhere <laughs> that God puts something into. When you give to the church or to missions, the benefits that you get for giving are a profitable amount of blessings that increase in your account. You know, uh, when, we go, when us clowns go somewhere clowning, or when those of us who volunteer at Loveway, or when you do something like similar to that, you're always blessed more than what you get. Or what you give. And that's the way it works. And that's the account that Paul's talking about. When you give, and he, I don't think he's necessarily talking about money here, but when you give because you care about somebody else, that comes back to you. In Genesis, in talking about Abraham, there's an interesting verse there. It says of Abraham that Abraham was blessed. But it doesn't stop there. It says Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. And, you know, if you have been blessed, then you too... <laughs> Were blessed so that you could pass it on, so that you could be a blessing to somebody else. And that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about giving generously. Who of us here today hasn't been blessed generously? With all the freedoms we have, with our homes, our families, all that we have, I mean, compared to the rest of the world, we're pretty rich. We need to be giving generously to other people. This reminds me of the story of a wealthy lady who, who died and went to heaven. And she was being taken around to see the dwelling place that she would have there in heaven. And as they were taking her around, she passed many great mansions, really beautiful homes where... She said, I, I, I can live in that one. But they kept going until they finally got to the outskirts of heaven. And there they found 
she found her house, a dilapidated, run-down house, and she was shocked. She protested, but why am I getting such a dilapidated place? And this is what she was told. Well, we're so sorry, but this is the best we could do with the materials you sent up. But you see, when we give generously, we're blessed in abundance. The Philippians had given so generously to Paul and his ministry that he had received everything in full, he says. And he says he even had an abundance. He says, I am amply supplied. Which means he was full. He was overflowing. The generous giving of the Philippians was like a fragrant and pleasing aroma. It was an acceptable sacrifice that was well-pleasing to God. And because of the, of the giving of the Philippians, they were blessed. Do you remember in Matthew 3 when Jesus was baptized? God's voice was heard from heaven. And this is what it said. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. All of us should want to do the things that pleases God. And we should want to hear those same words of us. This is my beloved son, or this is my beloved daughter, whom I'm well pleased. We can have contentment when we do the things that please God. And He will bless us when we do the things that please Him. So that we can be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. Hebrews 11, 6 says, that God rewards those who diligently seek Him. God doesn't need us to give Him anything. He already owns it all. But giving is one of the ways that we can show God that we're really thankful for what He has given to us. Paul said, And my God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Verse 19. One day a father of a very wealthy family took his son on a trip to the country because he wanted to show his son how poor people lived. They spent a couple days and nights on a farm of what would be considered poor people poor family. Upon their drive back to town, father asked the son, well, what did you think of the trip? Well, it was great, Dad. Did you see those, how those poor people live? The father asked. Oh, yeah, said the son. So tell me, what did you learn from this trip? The son answered, I saw that we have one dog and they have four. We have a pool that reaches to the middle of the garden and they have a creek that has no end. We have imported lanterns in our garden and they have all the stars in the sky at night. Our patio reaches to the front yard and they have a whole horizon. We have a small piece of land to live on, and they have fields that go beyond the site. We have serpents who serve us, but they serve each other. We buy our food, they grow their own. We have walls around our property to protect us and keep us safe. They have their friends to protect them. The boy's father was speechless. Then his son added, Thanks, Dad, for showing me how poor we really are. Learning to be content starts with a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
That's what Paul said here. His strength came from Jesus Christ. No matter what circumstance, he learned to be content because of Jesus Christ. If you don't know him today, we're singing an invitation to him. This opportunity for you to know him.